Thanks, and uh, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for attending the webcast. Um, today we're going to be talking about um, what's new in Vault 2020, um, and also some things that may or may not be new to you. Um, there's not a ton of new content in Vault 2020. What's new is very useful, I think, but um, not enough, I think, to build a whole webcast around. So I thought um, what we'd also do today is discuss um, some things that Again, you may or may not know about some things we discuss on occasion, but things that I think people aren't using very much in Vault, um, and kind of revisit those, describe them a little bit, and you know maybe it'll uh, give you some ideas on how you can expand your use of Vault. Um, and those are the Vault Data Standard and Vault Custom Objects. So that's the agenda for today, and we'll dive right into what's new in Vault 2020. And the changes fall into uh, three areas. Um, the first, um, better creation or better design reuse, I would say. A couple years ago, um, Autodesk revamped the copy design tool for Vault Workgroup and Vault Professional. Um, and this year, they've changed it significantly, uh, mostly from a UI perspective. And I think um, I, I can't think of any of the changes that I think are for the worse. <laughs> so I think this is a, a really great uh, enhancement to copy design. If you use copy design in Vault Workgroup and Vault Professional um, regularly, um, you're going to want to check out Vault 2020, um, especially for some specific workflows. It's just, it's much, much better. Um, some changes to uh, documentation. Um, the biggest one being around PDF creation, which we'll get into shortly. Um, and then um, better collaboration. This is something that Autodesk has clearly been working on for the last few years, um, making it easier to share data um, from Vault outside your firewall. Um, that's a pretty common request that I get from customers. You know, they have um, outside contractors or with their customers or you know, anyone that they need to collaborate with. Um, there are lots of different ways that they need to share uh, data outside their company. And the answer is rarely ever just to give someone access to Vault, right? Um, so Autodesk has been working on, I think, some great ways to, to share your Vault data in several different ways, depending on need. And I think they've got a, a really good solution uh, at this point. So. That's kind of what we're going to be focusing on in the vault portion of this. Um, we're going to dive right into copy design. Um, the interface has been changed significantly. I mean, if you saw the two side by side at a glance, you'd say, yeah, they're pretty similar. But there have been some really significant changes. Um, the first is the, the icons across the top that were somewhat questionable in function um, have now all been replaced with menus and toolbars. Um, with actual words, right? So I can understand icons in the past. It, you know, reduces the need to, you know, have localizations for different languages for all the different commands. But um, it wasn't particularly user friendly, in my opinion. And I think this is a great change. Um, we're seeing, you know, toolbars now. Those toolbars and menus can also be customized, right? Um, another huge change is the fact that the dialogue is now modeless, and we'll see this in a second. I'll show you the actual tool where you can leave the copy design dialogue up and still access the vault window um, separately, right? So if you need to add additional files to the interface, for example, but you want to find those files using the regular vault interface first, um, you know, you can still move around in Vault. Or if you're in the middle of a complex copy design and someone says, I need you to do X, you know, you don't have to cancel the copy design and start over or anything like that, which I think is great. Um, the ability to remove attachments and bomb objects, the bomb object especially is important um, because prior to 2020, if you did a copy design, um, you could still assign items to a copied assembly. Um, and the issue with that is the assembly will never have been opened up um, in Inventor and updated to point to all the new files and their new part numbers. So you would end up, you know, 
potentially creating a bomb that wasn't accurate and maybe not even realize it. So the ability to detach the bomb object from an assembly when it's being copied, I think is fantastic because if nothing else, that will either force you to open the assembly in Inventor and make sure the bomb is right or, you know, queue up, a, a, I think there's a job to, to uh, you know, fix the bomb data on something. Um, file names now appear after you've executed the copy. Uh, so if you're using a numbering scheme, um, you're no longer left wondering, okay, what are these new files called? <laughs> you can actually see what their new names are. Um, and you can go to source or destination folders too. So, um, you know, again, taking advantage of the fact that the dialog is now modeless, you could navigate, you know, with the copy design dialog still up, you could navigate to a folder either after the copy or before the copy um, to, to better interact with the file system. Um, they've also changed the way you can view the structure of what you're copying. Um, rather than maybe have throwing all of the drawings up at the top and say, okay, which drawing goes to which thing, um, there's now a documentation subfolder for anything that has, you know, a drawing related to it. So you can more clearly see, um, you know, what drawing is associated with which model file. Um, you can also change fundamentally the way you view the structure. Um, a folder view, um, a pure list view that allows you to filter, which I think is great. Um, and also the ability to clear um, root nodes. Um, so if you added multiple top level assemblies to copy and realize, no, you don't want to deal with one anymore, you can just wipe that guy off the list. Um, and also some of the side panels have been removed by default for simplicity, but you can still get those guys back if you're used to them. Um, editing capabilities as well, the ability just to click in a field and type, you know, a new name, I think is great. A lot of us get part numbers from like an ERP system, for example, and at some point in the process, or maybe when we start a new design, you know, maybe we've got part numbers already and we just need to, you know, rename the files as part of the copy design to our new part numbers. Um, I think it's a lot smoother now to, to do that sort of thing, to, to rename the files that way. Um, find and replace in the main grid, because you're allowed to edit file names and paths, you can do a find and replace in the main grid, which is great. Um, copy branch two, which I think was an idea station suggestion, um, being able to copy an entire branch and if there's a, a folder structure associated with it, um, that folder structure can be maintained in the destination. Um, and something really interesting, especially if you're, if you do the copy and you want to make sure that if anything comes up after the fact, you want to see, was it a mistake in the copy? Was it something I did? Um, you know, or just have it for posterity. You can export um, the, the operation to a spreadsheet, um, not for reuse later. You can't like import that to say, do the same copy again, because odds are it's not going to apply. The numbers or names will be different if nothing else, but, but you can have a record of that operation. Um, that you could put back into Vault if you wanted to. So let's take a quick look at the new copy design. Um, and what I thought I'd do is, is call up the 2019 and 2020 copy designs um, next to each other, right? So here's copy design 2020 on the left. And I'm going to call up, this is the same Vault, the actually the same assembly. Um, in 2019. So 2019 on the right, 2020 on the left. Um, and so you can see, first of all, right away, this new documentation folder here. Um, the fact that we can see carseat.idw is related to carseat.iam, whereas in 2019, all the drawings are kind of floating up above here. Um, we also see the icons here have been replaced with you know, buttons on a toolbar. Um, we also have menus as well we can access. But notice too, here's the copy design dialog. I can flip back to the vault dialog in 2020 and do whatever I'd like. Um, in 2019, um, I can't do that 
my vault window is actually off the screen right now on another monitor and I can't get back to it. You can kind of see how the copy design window is flashing a little bit. Um, but in 2020, I can continue to use the vault client, you know, just like I would otherwise. And when I'm ready to go back to my copy design operation, I just, you know, activate that window. Right. So that to me is just a huge, huge improvement. Right. Um, so some other things, um, the find and replace. Um, Notice here, um, we've got the different layouts. So right now we're looking at the tree structure. Um, we could also do a pure list view. And the list view, note that we can actually filter these columns, right? So again, if you've got in a particularly large assembly and you're trying to, most of it's gonna be reused and you just need to copy little bits, you could, if there's a, an acceptable criteria on which to filter, um, you could do that. Or if you, you know, you go through and say, I'm going to copy 30 different parts and you get them all copied and they're all somewhere in the structure, but then you just want to um, filter only on copy or not, or not, you could get rid of all the other things. Um, of course, you could always sort too, but then you could shrink your list to make sure you can focus only on the things that you need to work on. Um, and we also have uh, a folder view. So this is sort of analogous to the, the, the folder panel we had before, um, but you can see the entire vault context and where everything's gonna go. And you could drag and drop things again um, in this structure. So I think it's a much more intuitive, um, much more user-friendly way of, of copying. Um, keeping in mind too that you know, I can type in a new number here just in the grid like so. Um, and it is like, if I know I want to copy this thing, I can just type in a new number and it automatically sets the operation to copy. And I didn't have to click on anything or, you know, go to a different panel, or whatever. I can go right through my list, whatever the list looks like, be it tree, um, list view or folder view and just, click on a field, click again, just like if you were going to rename a file in Windows Explorer and put in the new name or new number, and that's going to institute a copy. Um, if it's got to go to a different place, a, do, a new destination, you can also just click in this field and rather than having to browse, just type in the new name or change the part of the path where it needs to go, right? So much, much more intuitive means of actually specifying what the new file names need to be. Um, if you commonly used copy design rules in the past to like reset property information or something, um, much easier to uh, choose a, a rule set to apply. I think it's much more intuitive. Um, but also too, if you use numbering schemes as opposed to just typing in, um, you could set a numbering scheme, sort of like a, an active layer or something, like if you're gonna start drawing um, and then everything that you choose to copy or copy to will automatically be assigned that numbering scheme that's active up here. So again, just, I think a whole host of UI changes um, that, that really are, are going to boost productivity if you use copy design regularly. Um, the other, th other things, remove all attachments and remove bomb object. Um, both of these, I think, are very important. Um, if you heavily use attachments or if you use uh, Vault's item and bomb behavior, um, this one especially, remove bomb object. If you use item and items and bombs, you should always have that enabled um, to make sure that you don't, um, if nothing else, start to create an item from an assembly only to realize that, oops, I didn't check it out and update. Um, right. It can be really confusing. You know, like what's going on? This is broken. Well, no, it's because, you know, you haven't let inventor update things yet. Um, so I think that's a really good option for those of you that use items and bombs and copy design. Um, the copy branch too. Again, if you've got, you know, an, an assembly selected, you've got an option for copy branch too. And then any folder structure um, that's, you know, can be determined in that branch would be duplicated automatically in the new structure. 
Um, there are also new pre-checks. Um, so if there would be a duplicate, so if I say I just want to copy this, but I don't bother changing its name, for example, um, and I try to execute the copy, it'll tell me you can't do that. The, the file's already there before it tries to start the copy and fails. Now, it's not going to protect you if you are manually assigning numbers and you put in, you know, the same number in two different rows. It's not going to protect you from that. So you still need to make sure all of your numbers are unique within this list, but it will check for existing files before it does the copy. And finally, if I've added, you know, other random assemblies to the list, um, you know, I could clear those root nodes, right? So I can add a whole nother assembly root level. And I can say actually, and even do some, you know, operations if I wanted to. Um, but then ultimately, I could clear this root node to just take all of that away quickly. Um, and if you're used to the other panels, if you remember in 2019, we had, you know, um, the where used view, the actions view, all of that stuff. Um, we can still get those panels back. If you look over the panels here, actions, folders, and where used, you can still get those guys back if you really want to. So if you're really used to using the interface this way, don't worry. <laughs> you can still get back to where you were, or if nothing else, maybe while you're trying to make the transition. But I think this is just so much more intuitive that I, I don't I don't think most people will really struggle with it. And I, I think it's I think it's just a fantastic improvement. All right. So um, beyond copy design, um, I would say all of the changes are fairly minimal, with the exception of um, PDS, which we'll get to in a second. Um, just some kind of productivity enhancements. Um, when you're going to a vault folder from the vault browser and in inventor, it should open it now in your currently active vault explorer window. Um, that I won't say it's guaranteed 100% of the time, just because they're two, they are technically two different applications. And there's always a chance that Windows is going to fail to properly inform the Vault add-in from Inventor of the currently running Vault process. There's always a chance that Windows will be the weak link in that operation, um, but it should be more consistent now um, rather than opening up a new Vault browser window. Um, updating the part number by default during the rename, which is what we almost always want to do. Um, better number like numbering schemes for factories numbering scheme changes in general which we'll get to pretty soon um, a new property has been added um, called has drawing so if you've got a, a large project and you want to keep tabs on especially if you distribute the duties between design and detailing um, and you want to be able to check up on you know the status of the project and how many drawings do we still have yet to do um, the has drawing property can now be used to search on, to filter on, um, and also be used as a restriction for uh, life cycles. So you could say, I can't put this part into a review state unless the drawing is done already, um, or the drawing is at least is in vault. So um, I think it's an interesting property. You may or may not use it, but um, especially if you've got a complex structure and you're not sure if, if your drawing numbers are different, you know, you could sure always go look at the where used tab and see, but you couldn't search or filter on that. And so I think it's, it's a nice little property to have. Um, now, in terms of documentation productivity enhancements, the big one is changes to PDF. Um, PDFs appeared um, in the last couple of releases, I think in 2018 maybe was the first time we had it. Uh, I can't believe I already can't remember when it finally debuted, but there were some real restrictions on PDF creation. Um, first, PDFs could only be created when the document was going into a released state. That was the first big restriction. 
Um, and the second one was the PDF could only go back into the vault. And so people still needed access to vault in order to get at those PDFs. Um, now, with 2020, um, they've removed both of those restrictions. Um, you can now create PDFs um, when it's going into essentially any state. Um, and PDFs can now be copied outside the vault when they're created, right? So you still need the job processor to make PDFs. Um, oh, one more thing, you can make PDFs on demand. So you can say, I want a PDF of this. You do still need the job processor to make a PDF on demand. Because even if you make a PDF, let me find a drawing here, even if you create PDF here, what you'll notice, I'm going to go ahead and clear my job queue just so we can make this really clear. So I have nothing in my job queue right now. But if I say I want to create a PDF, it is not opening, like, like if you go to the preview tab here and print update, that on demand is going to make that DWF straight away, right? It's going to open up Inventor in the background or Inventor server, whatever it wants to use, make that DWF and put it in the vault for you. Create PDF. Again, just adds a job to the queue, right? We're going to see that it's there. So you still need a job processor to make PDFs, but at least you can now make them on demand, which is nice. Um, and then the other super significant change, I think, is specifying the PDF publish location. So we could essentially forever, I can't remember when it was added, if it wasn't in from the very beginning, um, but you know, we had the ability to publish DWFs outside the vault, and even Vault Basic can do that. But it's not a great idea because um, that DWF gets created during check-in and sent to the folder on check-in, and it may not be representative of what gets released. If there's any failure in that DWF to create, it may not be completely clear to the CAD user that it failed, and it certainly wouldn't be clear to any consumers. They wouldn't know any different. Now, you could argue the same for PDFs, but um, at least there's a the job processor is making the PDFs. Um, you can schedule it to only happen when things are released, so only release data is going um, to the you know network folder. Um, and if there is a problem creating it, you know there will be an error in the job queue indicating we couldn't finish the job, right? So um, you know this is something that most people that I've talked to um, want wanted the ability to publish the PDF outside of Vault, um, and we can do that now with 2020. Um, and I do see a question about that: Does PDF update when inventor drawing has been revised? Um, it won't update automatically on check-in. In order for the PDF to update either in the vault or in the outside location, um, you would essentially have to either create PDF manually or you would have to make a lifecycle transition state, lifecycle state transition, I should say, where that transition would lead to a new PDF being created, one or the other. So. There is a second action to take to get these PDFs created. So they really most commonly are going to be related to state changes. So my drawing right now, it's not even in a category. Um, let's go ahead and throw this into engineering, for example. Right. And then, you know, ideally you would revise your drawing. You would check it in. It's a work in progress. You would then eventually release it, which I don't think it's going to let me release it because some children aren't released. Um, no, I guess I turned that off. So now a job could go on the queue to get the PDF updated. But again, you've got to have the job processor running in order to make those PDFs. Um, and the job processor, it will require a license of either Workgroup or Pro, whichever one you're using. And ideally, it should be on its own computer somewhere, not on the same computer that a user is using Inventor, um, just because A, overhead, um, and B, um, if Inventor is installed, the job processor will use Inventor to run the job. And if you've got multiple Inventor processes running, it can really confuse things like open. 
Um, you know, if you try to open from here, it might tell you, I don't know which inventor instance to open into. And so you really don't want to run the job processor, at least while you're doing inventor work. You know, some companies I've worked with, they'll run their job processor at night while engineers aren't, aren't using inventor, for example. Um, it just depends on how timely you need the jobs to get processed and how many jobs you've got to do. Um, and there's one other thing I want to note. I don't remember if I got a slide about it. Um, something that I think is extremely important for, again, consumers, because we're talking about PDFs and uh, people that don't use CAD, how they look at things, right? Um, Inventor 2020 has instituted this new, I guess, I guess you could call it new functionality. Um, it's called Inventor Read-Only Mode. So you can launch Inventor now in Read-Only Mode. Um, and what's interesting about this is it installs as part of Inventor. And but you don't ever have to activate Inventor on that computer in order to use Inventor read-only mode. So if you're currently using Inventor view and you find it lacking, which I think most reasonable people would <laughs> because you can't take measurements and um, you know drawings don't update in response to model changes, there are significant and real problems with Inventor view to the point where if your workflow is not extremely controlled, Inventor View can actually cause you problems. Um, Inventor Read Only mode can eliminate those problems because it can open an Inventor assembly or drawing. It's my understanding, I've not actually tested this just yet because it's still pretty new, um, that it will actually update models and drawings. The difference is you can't save anything. You're not gonna be able to export or anything like that, right? But I could, I could sure open up an Inventor assembly um, and look at things and even take measurements, right? So I'm going to go here. I'm going to open up. Let's just open up this guy. So notice my measuring tools. And again, this is inventor read only. I can take measurements all of that good stuff. Um, and um, if you install Inventor on somebody's machine and um, you don't ever activate it, Inventor Read Only will still work. So essentially we now have a, a very functional viewer for Inventor. Um, and we, I see some questions coming in. Um, does Read Only show up under default program settings? Um, I believe so. I don't know if it shows up as an icon on the desktop. Let me turn my, I usually keep my icons off because it's a little messy. Um, Professional 2020, I don't see Inventor Read Only as an icon here, but my start menu, I have a customized start menu for Windows 10, but it definitely is in the start menu under Inventor 2020. Um, and I could, I believe, um, create a shortcut um, on a desktop, right, to get to Inventor Read-Only mode. Um, another question, will Inventor Read-Only consume a floating license? No, it will not. Um, it shouldn't try to consume a license um, on, uh, of any sort when you open it that way. So especially if you've got someone who just needs to look at something and you're short on licenses, um, I don't believe it will attempt to consume a license of any sort. Um, and in fact, if we go up here and look at the about inventor read only mode, there's no, like inventor itself would have a, a button here to look at like licensing information and or to manage it if nothing else. So I believe this is just there. I don't know if there's a way to like download inventor read only mode itself from the web and install only inventor read only mode. But at least for now, you should be able to install the entire Inventor package on a computer. Um, and then, you know, 
don't activate inventor, don't put in a serial number or assign a license to that user or, or put in the network license information, and they could still launch inventor read only and look at things. And part of the reason I'm bringing this up, not to steal any thunder from like a future, um, you know, inventor what's new webcast or anything, but one of the options you have in Vault for viewing inventor files now is inventor read only mode. So if you, you know, right click on a model file and choose view, um, you know, rather than it opening up in inventor view, it should be able to be opened up in inventor read only. And I don't know if this works. Let's see. Yep. So it launches in better read only mode and we'll view it that way. So I saw another question come in here. Um, it looks like it's about the, uh, maybe the job processor. Um, you don't want users to install job processors on their machines. Um, you don't want them to run it on the machine. Um, when you install the Vault Professional Client, um, the Vault Professional Client um, or Vault Workgroup Client, either one I should say, um, it will always install the job processor, um, right? And notice I've, I've got 2018, 19, and 20 installed on this computer. Um, it installs the job processor um, no matter what. And I don't think there's any way to keep it from installing it. But you want to make sure that your users are not running the job processor on their computer, especially while they're doing inventor work, because it's just going to slow everything down and could cause them issues. Um, so the job processor really should be run on a dedicated computer somewhere. Um, and most of the time, if you've got reason to use the job processor, if you need to offload PDF or DWF creation, you're doing enough volume that it justifies relatively inexpensive license cost of Vault, right? Because you can get a single user license um, for Workgroup or Pro for that job processor. And then now as of 2018.2, you don't even need to have Inventor or AutoCAD installed on that job processor um, because the, job process, the Vault client now includes the Inventor server component, they call it, where that component can be used to make your, your DWFs or even PDFs. Now, Inventor Server, there are some issues with it on occasion, and you know, depending on the way your drawings are done, it may be that Inventor Server doesn't produce DWFs or PDFs to the fidelity that you need, and Inventor might. So you might still need a license of Inventor on the computer, you know, on the job processor, but you wouldn't know that for sure until you test it. Um, and I think most people can probably get away with just a license of Vault. Um, and it was, um, you know, the job processor, it doesn't need crazy amount of resources. You can even install it on a server somewhere that doesn't have like a virtual machine somewhere. Um, so, you know, or just, a an old windows seven or windows 10, you know, system that you've decommissioned, but still have around. Right. Um, so it's not it's not a crazy idea to have a job processor running on its own hardware in your environment. Um, right. So the last aspect, and I'm not going to dwell on this too much, is the idea of collaboration. Right now, Vault has been expanding for years um, to grow in capability, um, working with you know now I think over 30 different design packages that Autodesk creates, um, and even some that Autodesk doesn't. Um, a notable one here, SolidWorks. Um, if you use SolidWorks in your environment in any way, um, you'll want to check out the Autodesk Vault beta environment or community um, because there is now a, a completely new SolidWorks add-in for Vault Professional um, under development and in beta. And it's supposed to be a lot more capable. So if you've been considering you know managing some SolidWorks data with Vault Pro and you've tried out the the add-in and it just hasn't been up to snuff um, you'll want to get in the beta for the new one so you maybe you can provide some some feedback to Autodesk about it um, so but but the idea with Vault really is to to manage all of the engineering data um, in a centralized location be it you know obviously inventor data um, electrical data um, 
analysis data, CFD data, um, civil data like from Civil 3D or plant, um, factory data from Inventor's factory tools. There's some great factory integration with Vault now or Navisworks. Um, the actual management of change, right? Vault does have some change management capabilities. So, you know, there's a lot of, of functionality and has been for years, um, but all of that's inside the firewall, right? That's designed to be, you know, all the collaboration that needs to happen inside your company. Um, and what, what Autodesk is really moving more toward now in terms of expanding the capabilities of Vault from a collaboration perspective is now outside the firewall. Um, and some of this has been in there now for a year or two, um, the shared views, right? So if you just need to get some feedback from some outside collaborators, um, you know, you can send them a shared view um, of a document. Your IP is protected. All they can see is, is a view of it. I think you can even restrict measurements, um, and they can, but they can provide comments and markup. Um, or if you need to share actual, you know, CAD data, say with a, with a, a vendor um, or a contractor, you can use Autodesk Drive to simply throw files up onto a cloud site to make it easier um, for, say, your outside contractors to get at that data. Um, and um, they can download those files, work on them, and send you back, them back to you in, in some way, right? Um, but it's all like on demand from within Vault. Um, and then if you need a more uh, bi-directional exchange, um, Vault Pro has the ability to automatically synchronize data um, between Fusion team and now I think with 2020, um, the reason this is new is because it can also synchronize to BEM 360, which I think BEM 360 is in much broader use than Fusion team at the moment. Um, Right. So, I mean, today, if you're talking about, you know, collaboration with people outside your company, you know, a lot of the communication is through PDF, you know, other documents, um, occasionally like an AutoCAD drawing or a DWG format, right? Um, and there's lots of different ways that those files get to those various parties. An FTP site, if you're into pain, um, Dropbox is super common. Um, Buzzsaw is disappearing, right, which is part of the reason that this synchronization is needed, or I think more, more, more often than not, unless, you know, the file size is um, prohibitive, an email, right? Um, so the idea with this synchronization is to replace all of those methods um, with a much more controllable um, and bi-directional synchronization method through either Fusion Team or BEM 360. Right, so you can set up um, either on demand or on a schedule for vault data to go one way to BIM 360 or to be able to be updated back from BIM 360. So if you're talking about a contractor, for example, you can synchronize data to BIM 360. They can pull that data down, make their changes, save it back to BIM 360, and then vault can automatically pull those changes back down. Right, it's sim very similar to the old Project Sync and Buzzsaw. It just uses, you know, Autodesk's new cloud services. Right, so if you need to collaborate, you know, outside of a vault with people outside your company, I mean, technically it would even work inside the company too, right? If if you really needed to, if you didn't want to get them access to the vault data itself, but more commonly outside your firewall, outside the company. Um, you should really look at either Fusion Team and BEM 360 and Vault Professional, because that's going to give you the, the best way to control the data flow, either one way or bi-directional. Um, there's versioning capability in the cloud as well, so you don't have to worry about, um, you know, even the cloud copy of the data being destroyed by a contractor who makes a mistake. And with Vault, of course, we have got the versioning built in. So even if there is some data synchronized back down, from the cloud to your vault, it's always going to end up as a uh, new version. So you can always go back to that version before the sync if you had to. Um, and this mechanism also uses the job processor. Um, so a question about this, would the engineering services provider 
require a vault license? It's a good question. They would not, because they would, they would never be directly interacting with your uh, vault, right? They would be interacting with BIM 360. Now, your BIM 360 or Fusion Team site would need to have enough users to assign that ESP um, to a project, right? So that's where the licensing comes in. Um, but it's my understanding that the licenses for those things, at least for Fusion Team, is significantly less expensive than a vault license. And you would still be providing that capability on your site. They wouldn't have to pay anything um, unless you built into the contract that they pay for the use of it, right? Um, but ultimately, it would be your site that they'd be connecting to and it would be one of your BIM 360 or Fusion Team, quote unquote, licenses that would be that would be in use. Right. So, and the data sharing can be selective, right? You're not sharing the whole thing. You're sharing specific files or specific folders. Um, you know, again, the project sync, it automatically creates the jobs and a job processor executes the copy up and down. Um, it leverages the desktop connector software from Autodesk. You can see if I look at my PC, I've got Fusion 360, Autodesk Drive, and BIM 360 team folders here. So I'm now looking at cloud folders um, on my file explorer. And that's essentially how, you know, the vault, uh, the sync works is if a file from, you know, one of these folders has got to go up, um, you know, this, this shared folder, the job drops the files in that folder and it watches to see if folders get updated to that folder and then puts them in the vault, et cetera. So, um, you know, it's nothing magical, right? It's something that's been around for a while. It's pretty proven technology. The desktop connector is relatively new, but I think it's gotten pretty good. Um, so it's definitely something to look at if you need to do a lot of collaboration. Okay. Um, and one last thing about what's new in Vault 2020, um, better number generating schemes. This has been a big issue for companies that are spread out across the globe and use database replication for Vault and numbering schemes. Um, a numbering scheme would always come from the local ADMS, a number, a number would come. And there's always a chance that there could be some conflict because the databases only communicate every 60 seconds. Um, now you can say all of the numbers come from a central location from the publisher. Um, so it might take a couple extra seconds to get a number, but then you'd be guaranteed that every number pulled would be unique. And we have one customer for sure that runs into this problem on occasion, and this is just gonna neatly solve that entire problem for them. Um, it is also possible to, to have a custom numbering provider. I haven't gotten that into that yet. It's something you can figure on the server, um, and I don't know the full capability of it, but if the vault numbering schemes just simply don't work for you at all, but you still wanna use the basic behavior, um, that could be an option. Um, so that'll be something to look into. So that's it for what's new in Vault 2020. Um, I want to spend a few minutes talking about um, some things that might be new to you if you've never seen them before. Um, the first is the Vault Data Standard. Now, this is something that's been around for several years. Um, it gets better all the time. Um, and now it is. it used to be for subscription customers only, but now most people are on subscription. Um, so it's included now in the Vault installer. Um, if you're looking for it, when you run the Vault installer, um, there's an option for um, tools and utilities, right? So if you're looking for the data standard, if you launch the Vault Professional Client Installer, um, you'll find another under Install Tools and Utilities. This is where you'll find the data standard. And you'll see there are add-ins for Inventor, for AutoCAD, and for Vault. Um, and that's essentially what the data standard is. It's add-ins for Inventor, for AutoCAD, and for Vault. And it has a, a few different purposes. Um, first off, when you are saving a new document in either Inventor or AutoCAD, you'll get this dialog that pops up. Um, and it allows you to actually pick a Vault folder location 
from the vault essentially, um, rather than, um, let me get Inventor fired up here, um, rather than picking a location in your local workspace. Um, and that's always a potential issue when you're making new files with Vault. Um, without the data standard, you're always saving the file into um, a local workspace. And if the file, if you've never gotten the folder from Vault that you need to save into, if a user, you know, the best way is, you know, always to, you know, go to working folder, right? That'll make it on your system. But if you're already an inventor, um, maybe you're tempted to just, oh, I think I know what the name of that folder is, type it in and maybe you get it wrong and now you've got unwanted folders in your vault. So what the data standard lets you relative stability compared to an API. So we're gonna finish up today with the idea of custom objects. Um, now this is something you may or may not be aware of. Rarely does it come up in my discussions with customers using Vault, um, mostly because I'm talking with people that are using Vault for the first time and they're not ever really ready in most cases to implement the kinds of behaviors that custom objects lend themselves to. So the idea with a custom object is it allows you to capture something, some entity in Vault that doesn't already exist and apply some behavior to it, right? Um, they're independent Vault records that you create. Say I want, a, a, for example, I want to create, I want to manage the idea of tasks in my Vault or I want to manage RFQs as a thing we call an RFQ. And then those things can be assigned to a category. They can undergo workflow. They don't undergo revision right? They're just in a life cycle. Um, they can have their own properties and they can be linked to other files, other custom objects and files. So a good example is tasks, right? Um, we're going to get into that in a second. Um, once the custom objects are configured, um, you can create them with the default interface or the data standard gives you like a little data page to fill out if you configure the data standard that way let you edit their properties. Um, but the basic idea is rather than making a file and calling it, um, you know, an RFQ, for example, it could be a custom object. Now, if the thing needs to contain a lot of uh, information, I think sometimes creating a document is still the way to go. Um, and if it needs to be revised, for sure, um, you're going to want to make it a document because custom objects don't have the idea of a ref scheme. But this can be a way, um, I think, especially for something like tasks or projects, where you're really just managing maybe a singular flow to something, and there's just some property information, things you can easily capture in properties. Um, there doesn't need to be complex behavior, you know, because like an RFQ might involve you know, capturing a, a starter bomb and, you know, costing and margins and stuff. And so, you know, a spreadsheet would be really good for that. Um, but if it's just property information, a custom object, you know, could be great. So if we look at my vault here, I have a couple of different custom objects. I have tasks and I have projects, right? So um, I could create a new project. In this case, this is the default functionality. I haven't hooked data standard to this yet. Um, so we give this a project number, for example, right? And there it is. Now it could have some properties related to it. Um, notice there's not a whole lot of information. There's contents and where used. Um, but if you're gonna make use of these guys, it's probably more efficient to use the data standard, right? So the data standard actually does come pre-configured where if you have a custom object called task, these commands will automatically show up. Um, they won't be called this, I changed their name. Um, it's just a little um, you know, XML file that says what, what the name should be of that command. But I could create a new task, for example, and the data standard gives me a nice little window here. And it could even be, I could even use a numbering scheme. And in this case, there's always a description. Um, get customer approval, right? And these are custom properties that I've created. So 
So maybe we think that'll take, you know, eight hours. Um, and maybe I'm responsible for it. So that task now exists in my vault. And if I want to associate it with a specific project, I could actually copy and then paste as a link into the contents of that project. And so now I can see the project, it uses this task is related to it. And if I go back to the task, I could see it is used here by this project, right? And because the data standard is integrated, I also see the data sheet for this, for this guy as well. So I can see its property information in a specific way. So that's how custom objects would work out of the box. And, you know, for simple operations with no business logic behind it, I think they can be pretty effective. Um, these custom objects can also be leveraged um, with custom add-ins for Vault as simply as just like storage to still use the Vault database essentially and, you know, use its, you know, the fact that it gets backed up. And then the add-in can read and interpret these custom objects you've created and then apply the business behavior necessary to say automatically associate a task with a project or you know give a, a better UI when you're looking at a project to see all of the tasks, maybe even display a Gantt chart, something like that. That would be a custom add-in, right? But it could leverage all of the data that was stored inside the vault on these custom objects. So just something to think about. So um, that's it for what I've got to discuss. Um, a lot of what's new in 2020 this year comes directly from uh, feedback from the community, um, either from the beta or from the idea station. So if you've never been to the idea station and you've got some ideas you think that would make Vault better, um, please go to the idea station, submit your idea upvote other ideas. It's a community thing. So if you let, if you see an idea there, um, the, um, you'll be able to, uh, you know, upvote ideas that you like and maybe get them into the software. It also provides a status for those ideas. Okay. Um, and with that, we'll open up the floor to additional questions. Um, I do see a question. Does copy design still have match name feature? Um, I will admit, I don't, know exactly what that was. Um, all of the um, all of the panels that were in 2019 and prior um, are still there. Um, and I don't see anything in the new interface. I think that's explicitly called match name. Um, I would be surprised if anything is gone because I don't, I didn't see anything in in the changes where something has actually been removed. I can't, I'm not thinking of it off the top of my head at least. Um, so I would be surprised if it actually disappeared because um, the like the the old numbering page where you would go to like name things is still there. You can still set default suffixes and prefixes and do a find and replace. Um, so I would be surprised, I would be surprised if it's gone entirely. Um, oh, oh, okay, yeah, I guess to, to clarify, does that automatically name the IDW the same as the IPT? Um, yeah, yeah, it will do that. Yeah, that definitely did not go away. Um, so it's gonna automatically assume, so like this car seat here, if I go to copy design, um, and I, and here's the documentation of it. If I choose, um, to copy this guy, notice it did set the name automatically. And if I change this, it automatically, oh, I'm sorry. I think I had my screen paused. So let's display that. Um, notice here's the drawing, here's the model. So if I change the number here, it's going to automatically change the drawing as well. So that is still there. Any other questions? It 
has been a couple minutes. I'm not seeing anything else come in. Um, so don't forget, you can always, I think there's an opportunity um, after the session, if you, if, uh, you still have a question, um, you can always contact your Hagerman account uh, manager as well with additional questions. Um, just a reminder, we do offer, you know, complete data management um, services, implementation, sales for Vault, and some other systems if they're better meet your needs. And we do also offer simulation services, software sales, uh, actual analyses if necessary. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Ashley. Okay, thanks, Forrest. Um, if you also, if you think of additional questions later, you can reply to that confirmation or reminder email you received from GoToWebinar. We can get those to Forrest or your sales rep to get your questions answered. Um, and once again, if you could take a few moments to fill out the survey, it will just pop up as we close down today. Thanks for attending and have a great day, everybody.